Welcome to the Suncoast In-Depth Podcast. I'm Brett Watson. Joining me today is my good buddy, Dr. Troy Doucet. And uh, this is our second installment of um, what we're calling Reconstruction Junction. Yes. <laughs> Rebuilding a Sustainable Faith. So you have your own story, man. And uh, mm-hmm. and I wanted you to have a chance to share that Sweet. Uh, with everybody. So I guess... Um, the way that we started with Ricardo is he just shared a little bit of his upbringing, you know, um, faith background. So why don't you do the same thing and yeah, put people in? Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty basic, man. I I was exposed to a an amalgam of sort of religious ideology and praxis from an early age, raised Catholic, coming from South Louisiana, which is predominantly Catholic in mm-hmm. faith. Went through my first communion. Um, I've joked about that a little bit from the stage mm-hmm. and told some stories. Uh, but then my mom and dad um, made made a move. I guess I must have been in eighth grade. Um, they moved away from the Catholic church into a more fundamentalist uh, Bible church called Opelousas Bible Church. And mostly because they had really good youth programs. Um, the Awana program was where I was really introduced to the scripture itself, whereas Catholicism, I was introduced to the liturgy and mm-hmm. the theology, mm-hmm. uh, but never really got in depth into the scripture. And the Awana program, I don't know if many people are familiar with it, but you memorize scriptures and do projects, service projects, and you get little badges to put on your sort of Boy Scout uniform. Yeah. And they celebrate you in front of your peers and you sing hymns. And so that was very formative for me and really coming to, to read the Bible. Because before it was the priest reading scripture and homilies, mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, so I did that until my high school years. I uh, was stayed a part of that church. And again, very fundamentalist, very literalist when it came to scripture. But as I went into my college years, I was interested in a young lady who I worked with at a grocery store in my hometown. And she asked about my faith. And I said, well, I go to this church uh, because I never really was a bad or rebellious kid. You know, I did stupid things like every other kid. But I I was very interested in religion and theology. I even preached a sermon at Opelousas Bible Church for the Sunday evening service when I think I was in eighth grade. (laughs) No kidding. Yeah, that was my first time ever preaching, and uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, But Christy was a part of a charismatic church. It was called Word of Faith Family Church in Lafayette, Louisiana, which was a bigger city uh, than I was accustomed to. Was uh, that a Word of Faith? Oh, yeah. It it was Pentecostal. It was part of the, the holiness movement but had broken away more independent. So um, it wasn't the Pentecostals that weren't allowed to cut their hair or the, you know, the young ladies yeah. could wear makeup, but it was more of, of a charismatic expression in worship and in preaching and in practice, the laying on of hands, the speaking in tongues. Was it tied to the prosperity yes, movement though? Yes, absolutely. There was a lot of prosperity yeah. teaching in there. Although that wasn't the main focus. The main focus was really, um, the gifts of the spirit and, mm-hmm. and things like that. We didn't handle snakes or anything. But what I what I really enjoyed about it was the passionate worship. So the way I look at my journey is every piece of it has contributed to something that was formative and transformative inside of me. So sure. Catholicism taught me the beauty of the religious experience, even at a young age. So even when I was older and was a youth pastor, when I'd go back to Louisiana, I'd still go to mass with my grandparents. And, you know, I never was like, oh, this is heresy. I just appreciated it for what it was. Yeah. Um, the, the Bible church taught me to love the scriptures, like to really dig in and to, to, to study the scripture. And the charismatic movement taught me to really be expressive in my worship, that what God is doing inside of me should come out in some way. The lifting of hands, um, you know, the, the really feeling the emotional aspect of my existence. Yeah, that's connection. it. Feeling something. Yeah. You know? Well, it was uh, connecting with more than your mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And 
a lot of people are, you know, some, oh, I'm not emotional. Yes, you are. You're an emotional person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You may try to douse it, you know, or whatever, but there is definitely an emotional element to our existence that God created for connection. And I think that's, it's useful. And so th that's my three sort of patterns. Mm -hmm. And then when, um, I became a youth pastor at Word of Faith Family Church. That's where the youth pastor was a good friend of mine. He saw something in me, and that's he gave me my first opportunity to to serve in ministry. Now it wasn't a job; it was more volunteer oriented. Even though I worked a lot, um, and I became a children's minister. Then I was promoted to a part time junior high youth pastor. And that's when I told the story. My grandfather would actually come and listen to me preach yeah. at that church. And um, I felt called one day. We went to a conference in Dallas. It was called Passion for Souls. Because at that point in my religious journey, spiritual formation, you know, I was like, we got to win souls, man. We got to save people. Mm -hmm. And I was really good at it. I was really good at communicating with people about my experience. And we went to a conference about evangelism. And it was in Dallas, and I really felt like God was speaking to me, saying, you're going to come here. You're going to end up in Dallas. I didn't know one single person in Dallas. And lo and behold, I had a friend named Ty Grineau who moved from Louise, from Lafayette. He was a volunteer in my youth ministry, and he got a job at Texas Instruments. And he and his wife moved, and they started attending this church called Fellowship of Frisco. And... Um, the pastor there was a man named Andy Montewell, and I actually posted a picture of Andy and I just a couple of days ago. He was in church Sunday, and uh, I think you were, is that who you were talking on the phone with? Yeah, yesterday or no? That was my brother. That no. was my brother. Oh, okay. So Andy you must have mentioned him or something. So Andy. Andy makes this statement in church one day: "Hey, we're we're praying for a youth pastor. We're growing, and we need a youth minister." And so Ty goes, "I know a guy." <laughs> Andy says, "Give me his number." And so Andy calls me. And I answer, and we talk for a couple of minutes. He says, well, look, I got to go to staff meeting, but, man, I can't wait to see you in a couple of weeks because I was going to visit Ty and Kelly. And so the the story is Andy goes into staff meeting, and he has an associate pastor, women's pastor, administrator. And they're like, was that the youth pastor guy? And they're, he's like, yeah, that's him. He's, he'll be in a couple of weeks. We get to meet him and interview him and see if he's a fit. And they said, well, tell what, what what does he sound like? And Andy goes, from the sound of it, he's about 6'3", 240, black dude. Because <laughs> that's, uh, you know, my Cajun accent has yeah, all yeah, but yeah. faded. And so Andy being a, a Texas guy, I guess I sounded like a, like a black guy to him. But anyway, not to be racist in any way. But that was it. That was my start. Of, uh, and I stayed at Fellowship of Frisco for a long time. It was a very good um, environment there. So when do you feel like, um, so obviously at the, that point in your life, you, you had a very uh, firm faith in Christ and, um, and, and that faith was taking you on a certain trajectory career-wise. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was, can you identify one spot in time where your deconstruction started. Yes, I know exactly when it happened. Ex the, not the date and time, but I know the, the event. I had um, I'd started going to college. Again, I was at LSU, but I was majoring in, I was a pre-medicine major. I'd wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon and dropped out and focused just on ministry when I got hired at the church uh, in Lafayette part-time. Um, but I re-enrolled at Liberty University and completed my undergraduate there. Mm -hmm. But then I enrolled to do a master's degree at, um, it was the Criswell College, which was a Baptist association college, fully accredited in Dallas. And I had the option to do some, I needed some humanities credits to start my master's degree in theology and philosophy. And, um, I could either take him at Criswell or I could take him at the local community college, which was about half the price of what Criswell was charging. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to just do it at Colin and transfer him in, save yeah. save some couple of thousand bucks. So I walked into my first philosophy class. I'd never taken a philosophy class before. And Dr. Levi Bryant, who is my good friend to this day, starts lecturing and challenging certain religious faith, right? 
Um, and I was like, whoa. I just thought <laughs> it's common sense. Everybody should believe this stuff. And every question I had, every retort I tried, he had an answer for that mm -hmm. was rational, logical, and made perfect sense. And that was the start of this, this beautiful seed of doubt. And I remember- I like and, how you put that, man. Yeah, it's, it was beautiful. I wasn't mad at him. I was intrigued. I didn't get defensive. I, I, I just thought it was a, a wonderful thing. Like something had ignited a thinkerly side of my brain that I had never like accessed before. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the end of the class, this sucker gave me a C. <laughs> I hold that against him to this freaking day because now I have a PhD in philosophy. I said, yeah. you gave me my lowest grade I've ever had, you sucker. <laughs> and so he's like, well, you know, you know. So that, yeah, we still argue about it today. But I remember leaving that class going, when I finish this master's degree, I'm calling you. Because I obviously am not equipped. I'm just a youth pastor who was very passionate about faith, but yeah. not very rational about it. And I did. I finished my master's degree at Criswell, did three years of Hebrew, three years of Greek, three years to finish the degree. And I did a double one. So I did theology and philosophy. So I added an extra 18 hours of philosophy. And it was really interesting. I had a great professor. I'm not going to name him. I don't want to get him in trouble at Criswell, uh, who encouraged me to read Nietzsche, to read Derrida, you know, to read Merleau-Ponty. And I came back after I graduated in 2008, I contacted Dr. Bryant. I said, I don't know if you remember me from a couple of years ago. I was in your class, but I'd love to get together for dinner, beer, whatever. And he invited me over to his house, me and my wife at the time, Michelle. And I think uh, Asher was a year old. Yeah, he was born in 2007. Asher was a year old. Aslan was two years old or two and a half. And we get to his house and dinner is already served. Like we're walking in the door and the, the table's served. And we get to talking and next we're drinking wine. And next thing you know, like it's one o'clock in the morning. And we're like, yo, we got to go. <laughs> and he goes, I got to confess something to you. I know you're a pastor. I said, yeah, what is it? He goes, you remember when you walked in a couple of hours ago, five hours ago, and the, day, the table was set? I said, yeah. I said, I thought it was interesting, but I figured that's how you guys from Ohio rolled. You know, he goes, no, man. He goes, me and my wife were like, let's just set the table, eat, and kick him out because <laughs> we don't need anyone coming in here trying to save us. Like, he, we really thought you were coming yeah. to save us. <laughs> and at the end of that night, not only had I made a new best friend, but he says, I, I want you to start teaching at Colin, at Colin College. I need you. You would be amazing in the classroom. And I was like, me? A professor? And he was like, Yes. And so he said, go apply tomorrow, and I'm going to find your resume. And he turned it in, and I started teaching two weeks later at Colin. Wow. College. Yeah, two weeks later, that quick. And I'd been at Colin ever since until I moved to, to Florida. And so that was the moment that, that, again, that beautiful seed of doubt was planted, and that deconstruction process began to take root. Now, it didn't, it didn't cumulate, cumulate – until much late, until my PhD work, um, that th you know the the complete de deconstruction process happened. But that was the moment I knew there was more to this that I didn't know. And okay. So, yep. So you know how Larry uses the analogy of a brick wall, right, for different mm -hmm. beliefs. Yeah. Was there any one brick? or a couple of bricks that were the most difficult to take out of that construction, that belief system for you? I think the one, the one brick that caused everything to crumble was, again, it's not often for many people, it's hell mm. or atonement theory mm -hmm. or, or the inerrancy of the Bible. I'd, I had questions about those anyway. For me, it was foreknowledge, God's foreknowledge. Okay. Like, how do you account? Interesting. That God supposedly has exhaustive, error free knowledge of not only the past events, but present and future without error. And yet we still supposedly have free will. Like, mm -hmm. 
for me, free will was the, 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 the axiom on which human existence rests. Like I have to have volitional choice in order to be accountable for my actions. Because if there's no free will, then how can you, ha how can you hold someone accountable? Yeah. You can't. In theory, determinism looks great, right? It looks rational, it looks scientific, and cause-effect relationships. But at the end of the day, you have an ethical dilemma. Like, how do you hold someone responsible if there's no true free will? Bingo. And so how could God know that I would marry this person on this day, at this, this time, in this location, and me not have a choice in it? Because if he knows it, just because I don't know it doesn't take away the fact that he does. So there was something that was obfuscating to me about that, that maybe God is not human. You know, maybe he knows the future in a way that we don't. And that's when I was exposed to the guys of like Charles <clears throat> Pinnock and Greg Boyd in this concept of open futurism or open theism. And that made absolute sense to me, that there were certain aspects of the future that God knew, but not in the way we thought. So the future for God is not like the past for us, linear. Like this happened in 1975. Yeah. The More future like for God is like- possible futures. Like there are multiple futures. Yeah. Because when you do, some guys at MIT did a thing where how, how many choices do humans make on a given day? Mm. I mean, you walk into McDonald's and your choices become sort of exponential in what yeah. you can order in one location. But it's also what you can't order in that location. So that even adds to the exponential possibility and probability. And I said, now what if God knows the future, not like a line, but like a huge tree? Like this is one possible future of one person in one day, and God knows all potential outcomes. Mm -hmm. That boggled my mind, and I said, that's what makes him God, or it God, mm -hmm. and not me. And that was when I pulled that out and I said, God doesn't know the future in the way that I think he does. Everything came came crashing. That did it, huh? Came crashing down. And I said, I don't need this, and I don't need that, and I don't need this. Because for me, the, the, object, the, the objective truth of free will is where everything rests. My ability and choice to love God and others, free will. To love my family, to go to work, to hate, all in free will. And so forget the Bible, forget the, the, the divinity of Jesus, all that other stuff. When I said, if there's no free will, then everything else. And so when I made the decision, like God does not know the future, at least in the way I think he does, that was the starting block. Because what it did was it grounded, it grounded free will in my, in, again, in love, in truth, all that has to rest on my ability to choose and to be an autonomous human. And from there, the reconstruction began. Right. So the, the, that's what I wanted to get to next. So um, the reconstruction of your faith into what it is now, uh, just give us a quick summary of how that <coughs> played out. But still, I'm in a daily process of I don't, I don't want to call it reconstruction. I like to call it reconfiguring. So for me, it's, it's, it's a constant reconfiguring in terms of what I prioritize in my faith. So <clears throat> I don't, I, I think like Wesley sometimes, like there's certain things that are open-handed that I'm, I'm open to dialogue about. And there are other things that are close-handed, like at this point in my journey, these are non-negotiable. Like, these are things I have to hold on to and to defend, you know, not apologetically, but to say, I don't want to lose these. And so one of those would be sort of the nature of Christ's divinity. So I choose to believe that Jesus was divine in some way. Um, how to explain that, like I don't use fancy religious theological terminology like the hypostatic union, things mm -hmm. like that. I simply go, Jesus was anointed by God with this divine essence and being and connection that he was able to sort of transmit that and awaken and ignite that in other people. 
So when Jesus says something like, the things I can do, so can you, and even greater things. I think there's, again, we love to talk about transformation, but I also think there's a transmittance mm -hmm. of, of Christness that is already always present within us. That like a radio signal gets turned on and mm -hmm. we're able to do those things. And that, and for me, it, it leads, it's transformation. Like how can my life be a catalyst of transformation for others? Not necessarily miracles, you know, walking on water, turning water into wine. Those things are not very important to me, um, but a changed heart is. And I hold on to the divinity of Christ for that very purpose in that Jesus is the centrifuge of my faith. Um, What's open-handed for me is the nature of the Bible. Like, I, I don't hold that the Bible is authoritative mm -hmm. or inerrant or perfect from cover to cover. And it doesn't take much research to find out why. I mean, it's a very human book mm -hmm. inspired, I think, by God, but still through human authors who lived in specific particular times and that's what I'm gonna be talking about Sunday like there was a time for this and a time for that and a time for this um, so that that sort of reconfiguration of my faith has moved things into priority and how I express and practice that faith so in terms of like worship like I think worship for me is of utmost importance so when I come to church my mind is already sort of engaged to worship God and to lift my hands and to let God speak to me. Um, my mind is open to hear the, the preaching, whoever's preaching, right? Whether it's you, Larry, myself, to just be a conduit of whatever is true, let it come forth. And so there, there aren't many theological precepts that I hold on to doctrinally, dogmatically anymore except for the fact that i think in some way jesus was divine in in his essence and so um i mean really what you're talking about there is uh an intellectually honest choice yeah to believe that jesus is somehow you know the fact that you say in some way yeah. he is divine um shows that you're just being intellectually honest so you know yeah, God love him. If Athanasius was sitting here today, I'd say, dude, you can't prove that. I mean, so <laughs> let's just be honest with each other, That's right. you know, uh, or Arius for that, that matter. Doesn't right? matter. Yeah. Um, and the resurrection, obviously, the resurrection is something I choose to hold on to, like a, a bodily, mm -hmm. physical resurrection. Now, I can't prove that, right? Obviously. That's no. why it's a choice. <laughs> that's it. It's a choice. Yeah. And but I think, Brett, that's the important thing that what what is the grounding of my reconstruction choice? free will that was the, the the cornerstone or whatever you want to call it the foundation upon which everything else I would would come to believe or reconstruct or reconfigure would be built on would be I have to choose this it's not forced through fear or coercion or manipulation but I would choose to believe these things and be honest about them and if some better information came out that caused me to shift my thinking, then I would be honest about that and, and make that shift. Mm -hmm. But there's been nothing um, from the skeptical side that has given me any sort of evidentiary reason to deny what I choose to believe because it fulfills my life. It causes no harm to anyone else and it creates and probably good. produces opportunities to do good in others' lives. Oh, yeah more than if you didn't have that. Uh, yeah, I think th the resurrection is one of those things, again, um, nothing I could prove, but it's something I choose. Mm -hmm. And there are many people that I know even on our staff who choose to not believe in a physical bodily resurrection. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make them bad people or anything no. like that. It just simply goes, <clears throat> I choose to believe the resurrection is like a metaphor or some sort of analogy to something else. And I go, as long as it produces fruit in your life that glorifies God and causes transformation in the world, then I'm cool with it. And yeah. for me, that's where I choose to believe. You yeah. Know? yeah. 
That's good. So there are a lot of people in our day and age that are going through what we call deconstruction, right? Mm -hmm. And there are people sitting there, they're surrounded by this demolished wall of beliefs that they used to have, and they are feeling a sense of loss, grief. Um, It's one of the most difficult things to do is to deconstruct a a belief system that's so foundational to you. So a lot of people are doing this, though. You can see it on social media. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What is there something that you would want to say to those folks that you think would be helpful for their journey? Because the reason I ask this is because I, it's just my opinion, obviously, but I I feel like throwing the baby Jesus out with the bathwater is not only unnecessary, but not even a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, not that I think that those people are going to burn in hell for eternity or anything like that. Right. Right. Uh, and not that I even think that they can't live lives that are fulfilling and good as we measure good and, uh, and helpful to the world. Um, but I think that when that happens, there is a source of connectedness that's lost. Um, and it's just not needed. You you don't have to throw the baby Jesus out with the bathwater. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, what do you think you could say to people that would help them to reconstruct something more sustainable? I, th- I think I would say, like Kierkegaard would say, Soren would say, stop looking at Jesus situated and appropriated in a religious ideology that is an either or. You're either with Jesus or you're not. That's when many people throw Jesus out. Like there are other options that can call for Buddhism, for instance, can call Mm -hmm. us to live a peaceful life, whatever. Even the five pillars of Islam are are wonderfully beautiful and articulate. But if we can begin to see the world instead of either or, but a both and, like you can have Jesus and you can add elements of other faiths as well. Yeah. So I think... Bro, the teachings of Jesus are just unbelievable, like at the heart of what he is communicating. And it was always constituted in the direction of God as love. That's it. Jesus, a few times he might say, like, deny yourself for the sake of others. Well, Buddhism doesn't teach that, right? Buddhism teaches deny yourself so you don't get convoluted by things. Like, there's truth in that. But look, mm-hmm. dude, there's sometimes I want to have a little bit of excessive gumbo in my bowl. And I feel happy and merry. And the Bible t- tends to say there are good times to do that, you know? Mm-hmm. But I would just simply say, if you're going through a deconstructive process, like you said, don't throw Jesus out because you view Jesus as, again, situated in this either-or scenario. Like, Jesus never presented himself as that. Even when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, that is not an exclusive statement. Like you have to take in you have to take in the context of that language and the situation in which he's communicating that. And he is articulating something vastly universal in God's all encompassing, all inclusive love. And so, again, like I did when I did the teaching on John 3.16 a couple of months ago, like people's minds were blown that that verse has nothing to do with going to heaven or hell and everything to do with placing my trust in what is true. And Jesus' teachings are true. And why are they true? Well, it's not true by scientific experimentation and replication and duplication. It's true when I live it out. And it's what... Larry and I talked about when you step in that water, dude, that's when we begin to see transformation. So as people go through their deconstructing process, like I, for me, find the foundation upon which you can build and reconstruct that faith. And it's scary because the first thing many people want to do is how do I protect the Bible? How do I protect that, the Bible, the word of God? No, dude, no, no call me. Let's go have a beer. Let's go. If you don't drink, let's go have a water or a coffee. And we can show you that this book is a very beautiful book, 
But just because you have archaeological evidence that points to some some statements in the Bible doesn't doesn't make it the word of God. I mean, there are archaeological evidence to things pointed in Plato and the Republic that but I don't ever say that's the word of God. Right. Yeah. So it, we we pick and choose those things which we find authoritative in our life. And for me, the most authoritative thing is you have the freedom to choose to love or to hate or to believe or to doubt. And from there, you can reconstruct the faith that is that is subjective and universal in the same way, in the same because remember, man, we, we've said you and I have talked about this a lot before. You have to find beauty in mystery and not certainty. And God's beauty is absolutely found in the mystery of what He is or what God is. Yeah. And even humanity is still a mystery to some extent. But I mean, we're figuring out our biology. We've decoded our DNA and all these things, and we're getting better and better at it. But God is going to remain that mystery. And unless you can find beauty in that, then you'll always be looking for certainty and you're going to reconstruct walls that are going to just continue to be dogmatic. And I think that isn't that because, you know, if you if you don't see the beauty in the mystery, then you see it with fear. Oh, yeah. Uh, you see it as the unknown and, and because it's unknown, you feel afraid. And um, once you do start down that path of seeing the mystery as beautiful Man, it just changes everything, doesn't it? Everything. Everything you look at in all a creation, yourself, inside, outside, everything changes. So that's a good yeah, that's a good recommendation, dude. That's the that's the thing I'll say Sunday for those who listen who may come to church is un- until you're able to see love in the world in all things. Like, I'm not telling you to love the, the person who hurts and harms. It's not what I'm telling you to do. But if you can't see the person who's been hurt and harmed as needing love, that's what I mean by that. Every situation. Which would really be kind of a way of loving them. That's it. Just so to see them as people that need love. That's yeah. it. And so every situation requires love. Even situations that we find evil and whatever, they still require love. Um in some particular way. And you have the choice to do that. But you also have the choice to be bound by fear, to be bound by lamentation. Hatred. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. But free will for me was the 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 quintessential reconstructive piece for me. Yeah. I think that's good. We'll have to have Bryce in. Yeah, well, that'd be fun. Talk to him. For sure. As a determinist. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> he'd well, he'll, say, I'll he'd be say you only think that that's pivotal. Because you were supposed to. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny, man. Like Sunday, I'll talk about. It. We talk because we, we were working on the sermon together, and like we timing is everything, right? Timing is everything, and the difference between a home run and a foul ball, it's timing. Mm-hmm. But yet, the batters, you know, home runs are rare for a reason because they rely on the human free will and intuition and training and all these things mixed together. Mm -hmm. And for me, none of that is determined by any stretch. That's why there are a thousand balls pitched and only so many home runs. I mean, Michael Jordan, like every time he went to a championship, he won it. LeBron's been many times and hasn't won them all. Jordan has. Why? Well, timing's everything, man. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So. All right, man. Always good talking to you, man. Yeah.